So please join me in giving a PSB aloha to Dr. Nancy Cox. Oh, wow. Aloha. Oh, that's, that's spectacular. I'm so excited to be here. So this is great people, great science, and an amazing venue. And for many years, I would have loved to have been able to, to come, but I always taught at the University of Chicago first, right after the first of the year. There, our semester starts like the day after New Year's. And so it was very difficult to come. I think I've been here once, although in the very olden days, early on, I used to review a lot of the manuscripts and never got to come. So it's a real pleasure to be here and be able to stay for the whole meeting. And I, it's totally seductive. I expect to be back. So what I'll be talking about today is work that we're doing to try to build a catalog, a comprehensive catalog of gene to the medical phenome using BioView that Josh talked about yesterday in the morning workshop. So catalog is kind of a boring term probably for most of you, but I'm old and this is how I think of the catalog. It's like a wish book. It's got all your best things in it that you've always, always wanted. And so what I've always wanted is to know what do all these genes do? How do they matter? And in particular, how do they matter for medical disease, for the things that put people into hospital beds, the things we spend our tax dollars on, how do the genes matter? What do they do? And so, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to spend some time, but just briefly, on PredictScan, um, a new approach that we have for data integration for doing association studies in, in a completely new way, but it's published, and so that's why I'll just spend a brief amount of time on it. Then I'll talk about some of the preliminary results of the application of PredictScan to BioView, trying to make the case that the transcriptome is a major driver of even what we see as EMR phenotypes, talk about some of the novel gene phenotype discoveries, and focusing on genes where we don't, didn't previously have any idea of what the genes did um, from human or animal model studies. And then, and then highlight again the value of the phenome. So new converts are always the most religious, and I am totally blown away by the power in the phenome and the opportunity to use that Yes, to understand pleiotropy, but frankly, also to get at genetic mechanism in some really cool and twisted ways that I, that I hope to lead you guys through. So PredictScan um, is an approach at data integration. So the paper's been published. It was just out in Nature Genetics last fall. Um, and there's all of the software is publicly available. Um, and will be continuously updated as uh, more transcriptome data becomes available. If we think about the measured transcriptome, um, there's a component that is driven by just genome variation. So the genetically regulated expression of genes is part of what we measure when we do RNA-seq or, or any of the other methods to measure transcript levels. But of course, there are many non-genetic factors that impact gene expression. And those can be very local, like what you had for dinner last night, or dessert, or the drinks. And, but they can also be long-term. How many dust mites sleep in your bed? How, how, what's your, your level of exercise over a lifetime? All of those factors can affect what we measure as gene expression today. And then over a lifetime, the genetic factors that affect the regulation of all genes in all tissues and all of your exposures combine to lead us to develop diseases and phenotypes that feed back on gene expression. So once you've developed a disease, it completely changes the regulation patterns of many genes. When we measure transcript levels in 
cells from whole blood in children with asthma and children without, there are thousands of genes highly significantly differentially expressed between the cases and the controls, largely as a consequence of the fact that these kids have had asthma for some number of years. That makes it very hard to figure out what of the genes are the drivers and what of the genes are just altered in expression as a consequence of disease. But if we focus on the genetically regulated component, we have a Mendelian randomization experiment. And so by looking at this component and its association with disease, we have effectively a one-way arrow to disease. So the idea is we take reference data where we have both transcriptome measured and in, in the case of GTEx, which is where this, these data come from. Um, we have transcripts measured in many different tissues. So they collect data on about 50 di different tissues. In any one person, they get maybe 30 tissues or so. Some tissues are hard to get because most of the patients are organ donors. We don't get many kidneys as a consequence. Um, some tissues are fragile. Um, at first, we had a hard time getting quality RNA from brain. They tweaked their collection procedures and it got a lot better. But it, it's still very difficult to get pancreas, for example, because it's a really fragile tissue. And of course, some tissues you can only get in ma males and some tissues you can only get in females. So for any one individual, we get around 30 tissues. Um, and in addition to doing RNA-seq on RNA extracted from all of these different tissues, all individuals are whole genome sequenced so that we have the DNA variation as well. And the idea with PredictScan is to use GTEx and other large-scale RNA-seq databases that include genome variation as a reference panel where we basically build predictive models using the genome variation and the observed transcriptome across different tissues. Simple genetic models, so we, we looked at polygenic prediction, we've looked at lasso, um, we use elastic net, and I'll explain why later, but, but relatively simple models for the prediction. And, and then you, all you need to do is save the SNPs that go into the prediction equation, the associated weights in a database. And so if you look at the GitHub, you've got, there's a, a PredictDB, a database of prediction models. And with that saved, for any data set where you have genome variation, and that can be SNP-based genotyping arrays, or that can be whole genome sequence. As long as it's genome-wide and, and you have the genome variation, you can basically impute transcript levels at each gene across each tissue for which you, we've built predictors. Now, of course, the quality of this sort of analysis um, is, is going to be dependent on the quality of the prediction. And, and this association test you'll see here is a gene-based test. So for each tissue, we conduct not 9 million individual SNP tests, but we test the number of genes adequately predicted in that tissue. So for that reason alone, you've got su substantially improved power, but I think the real improvement in power comes from the fact that you're looking at an endophenotype that drives a lot of the biology for common disease. So just to give you a, a sense of, of, how, of the quality of the prediction, you see the significance of the correlation between predicted and directly measured expression as Q values less than 0.5 for about half of genes, Q values less than 0.1 for about 70% of genes. 80% of genes have a correlation between the predicted and measured expression levels. So in an out of sample, we can build the predictors in GTEx and go out into the depression gene networks data for whole blood and see that 80% um, of genes have a correlation between predicted and measured expression greater than 0.1, 50% greater than 0.2. As I said, the polygenic predictions didn't do so well, and that's telling us about the genetic architecture, I think. Lasso and elastic net are much better quality predictors. The transcript levels are not polygenic traits. They are, at best, oligogenic. Um, with a lasso, 
I think on average about 10 SNPs captures most of the cis level heritability, so the local genome variation. With the sample sizes we have in GTEx now, um, we've not been comfortable building predictors that include trans SNPs. So right now this is all built using cis SNPs, and about 10 um, constitutes the average number going into a quality lasso-based prediction. We prefer to use elastic net because it's more robust to the particular genotyping arrays that were used and how you imputed the data out. So by using elastic net, which often includes about 60 predictors um, in the prediction model, 60 SNPs in the prediction model, you've got a little bit more um, robustness to the particular uh, arrays that were used to, to do the genotyping. And of course, all of this is predicated on the underlying heritability of the transcript levels that we're trying to build predictors for. And, and you can see that, so the black line is the heritability of each gene in a particular tissue. This is whole blood, and this is actually from the Depression Gene Network data um, because it's the largest sample, about 900 where we have both the RNA-seq and genome variation um, available. And in the, the red dots show the prediction um, for that gene, and then the black line shows the 95% confidence intervals around the heritability. So the mean heritability across all genes in a single tissue is about 0.15, but you can see there are a substantial number of genes with, with high heritability in this tissue. And the key point is that, yes, in this tissue, there are lots of genes with low heritability, but in some other tissue, most of those genes get into the sweet spot uh, of heritability and quality prediction. So across all tissues that we have available in GTEx, there are 18,461 genes with a correlation greater than 0.2 between the predicted and measured uh, transcript levels in at least one tissue. So if you, if you look at Dan, Daniel MacArthur's got a list on his website, a growing number of genes that he calls loss of function tolerant. So that's a, an example of a set of genes generally not measured in this. They tend to have low heritability. They have high coefficients of variation. Um, the loss of function tolerant means that in sequencing studies, they see individuals walking around with two loss of function variants in those genes as controls in studies. And so that's, an ex that's partly why we don't get above 20,000 genes. So those genes don't have much heritability in any tissue. And basically, nature's saying it doesn't matter what transcript levels you have. Um, because you can tolerate essentially none, uh, given that people walk around with two loss of function mutations. In any single tissue, there are between four and 9,000 genes uh, meeting this criteria. So, so across all tissues, you catch uh, 18,000. Across, um, within at least one tissue, you get somewhere between four and 9,000 genes. So the advantage of this framework is that we do use more and more of what we know, because as GTEx grows larger, so there's about 500 samples used in, the, in building the predictions that we have today, but GTEx is headed towards about 1,000 individuals, I think 954 is their current target. As sample sizes grow, we'll be able to build better quality predictors. We expect um, over the next um, year or so to include trans predictors in the prediction models, for example. Um, as the sample size increases. Our signal comes at the level of the gene, which is where we know our biology, and, and really key, it has an easy to interpret direction of effect, okay? The predicted expression of the gene is either associated with increased, predicted increased expression of the gene is either associated with increased risk of disease or decreased risk. So you, you have a direction of effect um, that you can do something with, and of course, because the signal comes at the level of the gene, it makes it much simpler to do pathway and network analysis. Um, one of the challenges for that has always been, how do you annotate SNPs appropriately to genes? And 
here, there's no question about how you annotate SNPs to genes. It also sets up a natural framework for the unified analysis of whole genome sequence data. So that's one of the things that um, we've been working on with Bing Shan uh, Lee at Vanderbilt. So it really is, will be possible to use the common variants through this predicted expression idea orthogonally with the rare variants driving the protein function um, changes so with whole genome sequence data. So I think it's, we're looking at whole genome sequence data now, basically using this as a framework for the analysis. And, and what I'll be talking about today is the application of this in BioView. So Josh already talked about the synthetic derivative, which is this essentially Vanderbilt's version of a clinical data warehouse, de-identified and continuously updated image of the electronic medical record. Today with about 2.5 million subjects. Um, in BioView today, there's more than 214,000 with DNA. Today, dense level GWAS genotyping on about 20,000, exome chip date on about 42,000. Um, but by first quarter of 2017, probably about 3 million subjects in the synthetic derivative, 225,000 with DNA. And we'll have more than 120,000. We're estimating now about between 120 and 140,000 with the GWAS genotyping. And we'll have thousands with whole genome or exome sequencing. And it's not clear yet how many thousands. Um, it's one of those great things. You've all seen the curve of the drop in sequencing prices. So the idea is to, to cross BioView with PredictScan to do gene-based VWAS. So Josh already talked about VWAS. Um, I think VWAS has been used at the, in PSB talks for a number of years. People are familiar with the idea of using an individual variant and looking across the medical phenome. Here we're using a predicted transcript level for a gene and looking at the association of that across the medical phenome to build a comprehensive gene by medical phenome catalog. And of course, the impetus for this was research by ourselves and, and by colleagues showing that the common variant component of common disease heritability appears to be largely regulatory. So this was uh, an inspired uh, agglomeration of data where they basically combined 11 common diseases together as disease and all the controls together as control and looked at the concentration of heritability by different ENCODE annotations with the idea that if there's real signal, the fact that we put all the diseases together doesn't matter, um, you'll see the signal come up. If there's real signal in terms of how common disease heritability is concentrated by ENCODE annotations. And that's exactly what they found. So if you look at just genotyped SNPs from GWAS data across these 11 common diseases, you see a substantial concentration of heritability, about 40% of common variant heritability. So this is the proportion of heritability that you see attributable to all SNPs that concentrate into SNPs just mapping to DNA swan hypersensitivity sites. So about 40% of all heritability that you measure with all SNPs is concentrated into SNPs that map to these DNA swan hypersensitivity sites, most of which turn out to be in enhancer elements. But if you include the imputed SNPs, that goes up to nearly 80% of the common variant heritability concentrated in SNPs mapping to DNA swan hypersensitivity sites, which is all about chromatin conformation and almost certainly transcriptome biology, um, which they showed in other ways by, by showing that most of these were, were based on SNPs and enhancer elements. So, so that's part of the reason we've been so anxious to develop integrative methods using the transcriptome biology. But all of this has been shown using research level quality diagnoses, right? The, the kinds of diagnoses that, that we strive for in electronic medical records, but know that we don't easily achieve without building sophisticated algorithms. So we wanted to ask the question, 
Can we show this same, some evidence for a relationship between medical phenome and transcriptome biology in BioView using just Josh's FIWAS codes, which were very carefully constructed, required a lot of, of information to instantiate the diagnoses, but they're inherently different than what we use as research level diagnoses. So this is a figure showing the, uh, it's just a density plot of the tally of the number of FIWAS codes for each individual across the first 13,000 BioView subjects with GWAS. So, so it might be hard to read this. This is 100, 200, 300. So on average, it's about 20 FIWAS codes um, for each individual, but we've got a heavy, long tail. And there are plenty of individuals with tens or even hundreds of FIWAS codes. Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for us. So, so this is, gives us a really crude estimate of the burden of medical disease. And then we have a similar plot for what we might call transcriptome deviance. So this is just a density plot of the tally of the number of genes with genetically regulated expression, this predicted gene expression, plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean of BioView subjects. And again, so there are about 20 genes, 25 genes, um, with genetically predicted expression, at least three standard deviations from the mean um, in individuals across BioView. But you can see there's a substantial tail going up quite high. So the question was, do we see any correlation between the number, simply the number of FIWAS codes and transcriptome deviance measured just by the number of genes with, I think this one is at least five standard deviations from the mean. And, it, and it's a significant correlation. And this is a really crude metric, but it's consistently observed across tissues. Um, correlations are higher in some tissues and lower in others. And it, we can go down to three standard deviations above and below the mean, and it's still highly significant. So the, and of course, it gets more significant as we go up. And we expect to do much better. I mean, literally, these slides came to me this morning. I mean, I put these slides on this morning. The idea is the, you can include measures of severity of your FIWAS codes, for example. You, we can um, use information on the centrality of the genes um, when we look at how deviant the transcriptome, predicted transcript levels are. So there's a lot of ways to look at this, but even with very crude metrics, there's some evidence, even with EMR codes, that the, the transcriptome is really part of the driving biology for common disease. And in, the, in keeping with the Star Wars frame theme here, so I, one of my former postdocs has a brother that works as a special effects computer technician um, in the movies, and I have it on good authority that by the end of the next movie, it will be clear that it is the phenome that is the fourth force that is, is with you. And, and so most of the rest of the talk is gonna be to highlight the phenome and its power in these association studies. So it's not just that we can do a gene-based test. We get to do a gene-based test and look at everything in the phenome and how that informs us uh, about the driving biology. So here's reduced predicted expression of a gene, GRIC5. These are the phenotypes associated with This is the FIWAS code, um, the description of that, the number of individuals, and the p-value um, for the association. And what you'll see is we have retinal detachment defect, cataract, glaucoma, other disorders of the eye, disorders of the vitreous body, other retinal disorders. We, when this came up, we laughingly called it the eye supergene because these are not eye phenotypes where we expected the physiology to be shared, we ex where we expected a lot of shared genetic architecture. 
And so, so how is it that the reduced expression of a gene might lead to all these different I phenotypes? And I, I didn't have room to put them all on, but in fact, myopia and diabetic retinopathy and other eye disorders show less significant associations. So they knocked it out in the zebrafish. And in about a third of the zebrafish embryos, um, they were little cyclops embryos. They called me down to the zebrafish core to look at this. So you guys, the, those of you who know me know, I'm, I haven't looked through a microscope in like 30 years. And so they point, I go down there and I think I'm going to see fish with a phenotype. And they're like, oh no, you have to look at the microscope. I'm like, I don't know how to look through a microscope. I could, even I could see the little cyclops zebrafish. It was really cool. So about a third of the embryos had only one eye. Two thirds of the embryos had at least one small, badly misshaped eye. Zebrafish eyes are not hard to see, and zebrafish embryo eyes. And so this phenotype was glaringly obvious. You actually saw a few other phenotypes. Um, some of those zebrafish had some hemorrhage or cardiac edema, but over, the overwhelming phenotype was the eye phenotype. And of course, we were really excited. It was really exciting. But of course, <laughs> you're never satisfied. So I said, yeah, okay. That says GRIC5 is important for normal eye development, but, but why would reduced expression lead to all those different phenotypes? So they got a hold of antibodies to the protein and went back and looked at zebrafish eye sections and were able to show that the protein is very highly expressed on the lens. It's highly expressed in key parts of the eye where the optic nerve um, attaches. It's highly expressed in areas that control fluid dynamics in the eye, which would help explain glaucoma. The lens helps explain the cataracts, the retinal detachment. It's highly expressed also in parts of the eye that in control sort of the integrity of the vitreous body, the vitreous body abnormalities. And, and so it helps to explain how you could get something like also myopia, um, myopia, glaucoma, cataract. So, so it's, a, it's a really interesting set of findings. And gosh, with the CRISPR-Cas stuff, they got these results faster than we could replicate the findings in 13,000. So these first, um, these first findings were in 5,000, the first 5,000 subjects um, with GWAS, and, and they had everything here before we could replicate in the 13,000. Here's another gene, um, no reported associations in humans. It's a mouse embryonic lethal. Uh, it's, it was known to be, so no, no known phenotypes associated with it. Across BioView, you see it associated with infections. So gingival and periodontal disease, infections with drug-resistant microorganisms, bacteremia, methicillin-sensitive staph, bacterial infection not otherwise specified, osteomyelitis, dental caries, uh, pyelonephritis, septicemia, staph infections. And um, we're working now on knockouts of this one in both um, zebrafish and, so, and knockdowns in mice. And you see, as a consequence of the bacterial infections and probably treatment with antibiotics, a strong association with candidiasis. Um, you see, probably as a consequence of the associations with dental caries and gingival disease, diseases of the hard tissues of the teeth. Probably because of the pyelonephritis, you see back pain and chronic kidney disease. You see, pro there's probably some association to s stomach infections and ulcers. But here in gold, you see a set of associations that we see with all other genes that have this pattern of association with chronic infection, of late effects of cerebrovascular disease, cerebral atherosclerosis, intracranial hemorrhage, and cerebrovascular disease. These, are, these phenotypes are associated with every gene that has this pattern of chronic infection, while coronary atherosclerosis is across the board associated with inflammation. Cerebral atherosclerosis seems to be associated with chronic infection, which is kind of a creepy, scary thing. And like, um, so worth 
following as we increase sample sizes here. Here's an example of a gene that looks like a cystic fibrosis modifier. So you see the top association is with cystic fibrosis, and it's definitely not um, CFTR. But you see it's associated with the phenotypes that leads physicians to be suspicious of a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, pseudomonal pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, respiratory insufficiency, chronic sinusitis, MRSA pneumonia, aspergillus, so across the board. And with cancer of the bronchus and respiratory system also, so whether that's a pleiotropic direct effect of the actions of this gene or a consequence of chronic infection and inflammation in the lung, I think is, a, is an interesting question. Um, but it's increased genetically predicted expression of this gene that's associated with disease, so it makes it an interesting thought for a potential um, drug target. And there's a half a dozen other genes that would be candidates for um, being a modifier of cystic fibrosis with exactly this kind of pattern where top associations are with cystic fibrosis, but the primary driving associations are for lung infections. Fracture is a really interesting phenotype in the EMR, associated with much more um, genetic load than I would have expected, and, and has different patterns with different genes. So here's an example of one where increased genetically predicted expression of a gene is associated with increased risk of fracture. And these are all lower limb fractures. And with other genes, I've got only upper limb fractures. With other genes, I have sort of truncal fractures. It's, and, and then there are genes where you see osteoporosis, osteopenia, and just fractures across the board. Here's another one with fractures. So you see fracture of the patella, unspecified bones, fracture of the humerus, um, and, and some potentially associated thing, open wounds of extremities, maybe from the, track, from the fractures, um, traumatic arthropathy, disorders of gas. So I, it's hard to know what the driving biology for this might be. Um, you see asthma and nasal polyps. Um, there's some evidence of increased infection, but who knows? And then, then you see schizophrenia come up. And, and we have other fracture phenotypes also associated with schizophrenia, so that's something we're keeping an eye on. Here's a completely different pattern for fracture. So you see a couple of fractures here, but it's probably about these vertiginous syndromes, so dizziness. So you, you see some of the classical diagnoses, so the vertiginous syndromes, peripheral or central vertigo, um, sensorineural neuronal hearing loss, Meniere's disease, and maybe the hypocalcemia contributes too, but, but maybe they just get dizzy and fall down and break things, um, or, <laughs> or have adverse effects of sedatives that make them fall down. So, there's really interesting things to learn about potential mechanisms. This is another other kind of fracture, so you get a significant association with fracture of pelvis. And this is not a small number of individuals, but is it about hypoglycemia and falling down because there's no other fractures here? You see um, further down the list, syncope, collapse, and hypotension. Um, but you also see some disorders of muscle, ligament, and fascia, and further down you see other kinds of fractures. So this is going to be an interesting one to follow up to. Fracture of the pelvis is no picnic. So it would be interesting to learn about this. It's increased G-Rex of this gene also. And so these were ones where like, I started with the gene and was looking at what phenotypes were associated with it. But you can start with the phenome. You can start with a phenotype that you're interested with. In, and so when I talked to Terry about what to talk about, she said, oh, you, you should be provocative. You should choose any phenotypes you want. I said, well, pick one. And so, so you, can, like you can learn things about phenotypes that you never would have you know, thought to look at for heritable phenotypes. The three genes that have um, genome-wide significant associations with erectile dysfunction, um, so, so one um, in heart and two in whole blood, wh where the predictors were built. Really interesting association here, curvature of the spine, kyphoscoliosis and scoliosis in addition to Renaud's syndrome. So, of course, erectile dysfunction is a male phenotype, 
And for the most part, scoliosis is a female phenotype. So we, and we have, again, with one of the other genes, related phenotypes. A couple of years ago, Derek Gordon and colleagues at the American Society of Human Genetics meetings reported on an intriguing association um, where they had uh, baldness associated in males with one allele at a particular locus and scoliosis, I believe, associated with the other allele in females. And um, hypo, so baldness maybe with high testosterone, um, maybe lower test, I, I don't know, but it, it's an interesting thing to see the scoliosis and musculoskeletal deformities of the spine both associated with the erectile dysfunction phenotypes in genes where the predicted expression is actually genome-wide significant for this phenotype. Like, I, I, I was expecting, if we saw anything at all, to see the phenotypes that, that drive um, erectile dysfunction. You know, chronic diabetes, being really sick with other things, maybe alcoholism or other, or drug abuse, but, um, but that, that was not the case. Now, if you go down to the genes, the next tier down, not genome-wide significant yet um, in 5,000, um, then, then you start to see sicker people. So cardiac pacemaker, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, renal failure, and association with erectile dysfunction. Peripheral neuropathy, electrolyte imbalance, with, which we saw up here as well, um, asthma, acidosis, uh, Intrinsic circulating anticoagulants and varicose veins, malaise fatigue, another interesting one. Heart failure, heart disease, kidney disease, kidney failure, really you know, sick people here. Um, so, so this was more what I expected to see, but, but there are clear um, relationships among some of the phenotypes, despite the fact these are all cis-level predictors, these genes unlinked to each other, all on different chromosomes. There's no correlations among the predictions for any of these genes, but you do see some of the same phenotypes showing up as associated. And that brings me to the, the sort of twisted thing that I was gonna close with today. When you, when you look at these, it, it's really striking that the, the fact that this has a direction of effect allows you to, to think about things a little bit differently. So what is the opposite of disease? The predicted expression phenotypes look very much like this across the board. So, so just looking at the predicted expression phenotypes, you generally see a normal distribution across this large number of individuals. And if I tell you that, that people in the tail of increased expression for this have increased risk of acute myeloid leukemia, where in this curve do you want to be? Russ, where do you want to be? <laughs> well, you saw, you saw this one before. So the thing is, <laughs> these people are almost always at increased risk for some other disease. And me, I'm, I always want to be in the middle with all the healthy people. Like, you probably never want to be in the tails of a distribution. We think we do. You know, yeah, intelligence and beauty, whatever. You think you do, but you always pay for it. Like, just ask your family how that's working out for them. <laughs> So, so, so the question is, if I gather up all the genes significantly associated with, acute, with risk of acute myeloid leukemia, is there any commonality to the diseases at the opposite end of the distribution? That's, so what's the opposite from a genetic perspective in this transcriptome space of acute myeloid leukemia? So four genes significantly associated with acute myeloid leukemia, three of them showing association because of increased expression of the gene, one with reduced expression of the gene. And if I now flip the, and look at the opposite end, what do I see? They all have cellulitis, abscess, sepsis, SIRS, shock. And they have some phenotypes that increase your risk of, of these. They have some phenotypes that you see as a consequence of sepsis and SIRS. But, but I think the, the fundamental opposite is this sepsis. So I said, okay, 
sepsis is actually a lot more common than acute myeloid leukemia. What if I start with sepsis and look at that? So, um, so I've got these genes associated with sepsis. Um, so starting with sepsis, so these have to be highly significantly associated. And, and they're all, again, um, they have other phenotypes associated with them that are completely different. So yes, they're all associated with sepsis, but this one's also associated with acidosis, um, visual field defects, vertigo. Um, this one's associated with a number of disorders of the eye, benign neoplasms, aseptic necrosis of bone, peripheral circulatory disorders. Here, type 2 diabetes, disorders of liver, syndrome X. All associated also with sepsis, uncorrelated to each other. And it's all about cancer. So flipping them, so you see the acute myeloid leukemia, myeloid leukemia, lymphoid leukemia, nodular lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, secondary malignancy of lymph nodes, malignant neoplasms of bladder, other urinary organism, organs, kidney, liver, bile duct, stomach, stomach larynx, oropharynx, basal cell carcinoma, and pancreatic cancer. And so, so sepsis, of course, it is a massive infection. There's probably a tendency to have infection, but to over-respond to it, to, to be um, extremely uh, hyper-responsive to having an infection. That's, that's a driver of sepsis. The opposite of a lot of the cancers are, are different kinds of hyper-responsive infection phenotypes. The opposite of breast cancer is diverticulo diverticulitis, diverticulosis, so the increased sort of response to stomach infections of bone cancer. The opposite of bone can cancer is hyper-responsive airway infections. It's a, there's some really interesting biology that I think will be a blast to follow up. So I was trying to see whether the opposite of morbid obesity um, would maybe include anorexia, but not really. So again, flipping those around, there was some cancer, um, some infection, bacterial, viral, and fungal. And if I start with anorexia, um, benign neoplasms, the opposite, you know, eye diseases, fungal and bacterial infections. So you see some liver disease. So, I, so not so easy always to see the patterns, but I think it's, it's really going to be fun and interesting. I've been talking about a lot of results in 5,000. Some of the results were the preliminary studies on, on all genes in 13,000. But um, as I said, over, by 2017, we're going to be passing through 25,000, 50,000, and 100,000 plus. So there's really interesting science in figuring out how to utilize all of the phenome information. Because for the most part, these are different individuals with somewhat related phenotypes. And so assessing the statistical significance is going to be fun and interesting. But fortunately, we'll have um, large numbers of samples. Um, these are my partners in crime. And um, special thanks go to Eric Gamazon and Lisa Bastarash, who ran all of, the anal all of these initial analyses, um, and my partners in crime, Dan and Josh. And um, every band needs a sound engineer. Um, we need a computer scientist who keeps our clusters running. That's Anwar. Um, are my colleagues in the zebrafish facility. And of course, BioView is a creature of the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, Victor. Um, and my GTEx colleagues and the GTEx group. So thank you very much. And I tried to leave lots of time for questions. Hi, excellent talk. Did you see any sort of association with genes that have tissue-specific expression, and do you factor that in into your risk predictions? Yeah, yeah. So, so there were really interesting things. Um, if you take, for example, the gene for um, hemochromatosis, uh, and you look at predicted expression in the heart, you can see the cardiomegaly phenotype, as you would expect. 
um, predicted expression in the liver, you, sh you can see the splenomegaly and hepatomegaly phenotypes that you often see with um, hemochromatosis. So, so, so there are defi definitely some aspects of this that are tissue-specific biology that you can highlight in different ways. That said, we have some really strong associations, for example, to neuropsychiatric phenotypes with predictors built in whole blood. In, in large part, that's reflective of shared genetic architecture for these genes sort of across the board, wherever they're expressed. And, and when that happens, whatever tissue you have the most samples in is probably your best quality predictor. We've done a lot of work in type 2 diabetes where genes that we know affect the biology through beta cells in the pancreas sometimes have their best quality um, associations with our tibial artery. And the gene's highly expressed in tibial artery, but it's also expressed in pancreas. We just get better quality because we have more artery than we do pancreas in building the predictors, and they're highly correlated across those two tissues. The prediction equations that we build in one are, are highly correlated with the, other, with the predictors built in the other, but it's, better, it's always going to be a better quality predictor when you have larger numbers of samples to build the prediction equation. So some of it is, is, is genuinely about the tissue specificity. If a gene is expressed in a single cell type in a single tissue, you are only going to see associations when you've been able to build predictors in that tissue. But, but a lot of the architecture is shared, and, and you can take advantage of that uh, when, you, when you look at predictors across multiple tissues. Thanks. Gene Hansen, that was such a thought-provoking talk. I'm not sure where to, to point, but I want to try two related things. So one is the opposite of disease idea is just lovely. But I'm not sure I buy all of your conclusions yet because all of your people are sick, right? The way you get into BioView is to be in the hospital, right? So people well, who... not exactly. Not, not exactly. There are plenty of people in BioView because they came to have a baby. That's, that's how sick they are. They came to have a baby, and okay. people get well, you know, well checkups for work. I, I, I hear you, and yeah, this is all really preliminary and fun at 5,000 or 13,000. The beauty is going to come when we can do this in 100,000 and, and, and really look at how consistent the phenotypes are and what these opposite looks like, look like in, in, in individuals, but in a sense, the I mean, we have kids too, so I mean, children, and so there, I think there's some. Would you want to sample, a, you know, a long-lived? I hate the hospital. I don't go to see doctors. Yeah, yeah. Population I, would that I, be an important I thing to have in there? I think there's a lot of ways to validate these kinds of findings um, in other biobanks um, through Emerge, uh, other kinds of activities. All right, and that's sort of related. It seemed to me in the early part of the talk. Um, the DNA's hypersensitivity sites um, seem to be the, the, not only just the majority, but almost all of your predictiveness. So is there some sense of these are people who are, who, whose regulation is somewhat disrupted generally and who are just going to get sick rather than folks who are not? So I think that, I think it's really important to remember we build these predictors in a reference population so GTEx is a, you can think of it as a more or less random sample of people who die and agree to be organ donors. And they have all kinds of contexts. They all die of something, right? They've all taken drugs. They've all, they've all had other diseases that didn't kill them. Um, and so this is about normal variation in gene expression and what happens when you're in the tails of that. And, and I think this, the relationship between the number of FIWAS codes and the number of genes in which you're at the tails of a transcriptome distribution is another indication of how transcriptome biology drives medical phenomes. But, but it is normal variation in the sense that these are all common variants. This is all we, we all have about 20 genes where we're three standard deviations above or below the mean, and sometimes that's a relatively benign thing, and sometimes it's not so benign. I, I have a 
a comment and a question. So the comment is, you know, Nancy, I've, I've heard you give uh, talks, a number of talks over the years, and um, I'm always, like, you always have these insights that I'm thinking, you know, I could eat salmon for a year, you know, and I would never, you know, I would never come up with these ideas. <laughs> so I just, I just love, uh, thank you. The question I have is with re regards to that issue about the opposite of disease. So, you know, if we take Fisher's, you know, sort of classic model where you have the mixtures of the three normal distributions corresponding to the three genotypes, and then you do the threshold-based, uh, you know, definition of disease, Basically, what you're saying is that you would the controls wouldn't be those people that are you know in the other tail, right? Because they would have some other kind of disease, right? And so, doesn't that mean then you actually want to pick the heterozygotes? It isn't that going to affect your statistical power? No. Well, so if I want controls for acute myeloid leukemia, I don't care where people are in the distribution, right? They can have they can be at the they can be anywhere with respect to any of the genes that are associated, as long as they don't have acute myeloid leukemia, they're reasonable controls. When you're asking the question, um, what is the, uh, is there a commonality to what happens when you have the sort of opposite tail of mm -hmm. expression of any of the genes that increase risk for acute myeloid leukemia? So, in all honesty, though, if this was a lark. I didn't expect to see any commonality. I expected to see diseases associated with that flip, but not the same diseases. Uh. And to, to see so consistently, and I have to admit, at least with respect to cancer, it's been consistent. Um, and I haven't had time to look at very many others yet. Um, that's what's surprising, I think, that there's any consistency in what you see. Okay, thanks. That was awesome, thank you. Um, I have a, a sort of a follow-up on Larry's question. So uh, when you look at GTEx data, you are looking at people that died, and, and most often these are not kids, right, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Right, so whatever the expression is that changes for whatever tissue over time, that would not be part of this consideration. Okay, so yes and no, and, and I wanna come, I think this is a really key point. And so what is, is context specificity in, the, in, in <coughs> tissues like this? So it's not, it's not age per se, it's how age affects things like salinity and pH, all the things that drive how tightly wound DNA is, um, the concentration of ions, those, those are the things that are really affecting context, like age-specific context, um, drug-specific ex effects on expression. And, and so by, by estimating, um, building these prediction equations in a reference panel, and we have, we have some younger people who died, only adults, um, so we have kind of a bump at the age where, and it's mostly males, there's a lot of car accidents and some gunshot trauma and things like that. So we have some young people, and, and then mostly older people. But all of the contexts that, that affect that, those kinds of age things are probably also affecting a lot of the other contexts. So a lot of the things that we talk about as context specificity is is context dependence, but not necessarily very specific to a given context. When you think about salinity, pH, ion concentrations, and those kinds of things, which is a lot of what affects this, how chromatin and DNA interact to unwind and, and, and yield differences in transcript levels. And genetic variation that, that affects transcript levels is affected by those contexts, and that's why so much of the time, the context dependency is not an on-off thing. It's a difference in effect size that reflects things like salinity, pH, and so forth. So, so, so yes, we're, we're not, we don't have kids, we don't have infants. You'd love to have sort of the whole age span. And I, I think there's some hope that GTEx will actually go deeper in a smaller number of tissues 
including younger individuals, including more diverse samples, um, including more females, because it's, it's male heavy now, because it's the surviving spouse or oldest child, usually a male that decides for a deceased female, but it's usually a female that decides for a deceased male. The women agree, the men are less likely to. Um, so, yes, that's a wonderful point, but I guess what I was more concerned about is the, the difference um, that you're observing afterwards, so after you've built the predictor. Um, so if you don't have the differences, the age-related differences in expression, some of the diseases that you would be able to observe or to predict using the expression data would be, well, all of the diseases would not be an early developmental disease, right? So something... Yeah, yeah, no, so, so I hear you, but, but we have <coughs> amazingly strong association with phenotypes like failure to thrive mm -hmm. and cerebral palsy, which are apparent, uh, which, which are essentially early developmental phenotypes. So again, the, the contexts that we do pick up as as things that, that get into the prediction equations. Why do we have 10 SNPs for, for cis, even with the lasso? Because there's some context dependency that's coming in. And, and yes, the very best effect sizes for young people may not be the same effect sizes we're measuring in this GTEx older population, but a lot of those SNPs are getting into the prediction equations and that's probably the main thing. Okay, and very quick, sorry. Um, one, one last one. So uh, cancer and the opposite of cancer is, is pretty cool. That's very awesome. I love that idea. But um, so I'm wondering if cancer being uh, usually a somewhat later stage disease, you are picking up signals significantly better for that. Yeah, no, I, so, so I think, you know, the two main <coughs> sorts of biology I was thinking about were stem cells. Mm -hmm. So the dri driving biology around stem cells and, and where those are and what, how that might work. But then also this notion of, of the immune aspects of cancer. So the cancers we see have es essentially escaped being um, caught by our immune systems. And so in that sense, the opposite being a kind of a hyperactive sure. response to immune kinds of things is an interesting um, opposition phenotype. Cool, thank you. Hello. Okay. okay. Yes. Exciting work. Um, I have a question. I hope it's not reductionist and dumb, but um, I'm looking through databases like the NHLBI variant database. It's quite apparent that there are a lot of haploinsufficient individuals walking around for different genes, and I'm very interested to know whether that is a strong signal when you start integrating that with the phenome. Yeah. And so my question is, if you do this reductionist thing and you just look at single allele loss of function in your data set, how many of those alleles seem to have signal? Yeah, so, so Josh has done more of that with the exome chip data in FIWAS with um, individual SNPs with, you know, likely strong effects, code, rare coding variants. Right. And I think, and, and you definitely see some strong associations in multiple phenome categories, as you might expect, with some evidence of pleiotropy. I think, um, but I think there's opportunity for the transcriptome to be interacting even there. One of the things we see is that the Mendelian disease genes have phenotypes that you might expect for reduced expression. So when it's haploinsufficiency, for example, um, a, as a driver of the Mendelian phenotype, reduced expression of that gene reduced genetically predicted expression of that gene is associated with many of the subphenotypes making up the Mendelian disease. But for some, we see other strong phenotype associations in addition. And we wonder, and you know, one of those is, is the hemochromatosis gene, for example, right. where we see in addition to some of the expected phenotypes, kidney failure. And the kidneys accumulate iron just like many of the other organs do but the, it, they don't usually fail in people with hemochromatosis. Whereas with the predu reduced predicted expression, they are failing, and we wonder if those are people carrying hemochromatosis mutations in addition to having reduced expression. So it'll be really fun.
fun to have um, BioView whole genome sequenced at some point to be able to yeah, look at that. Yeah, I guess that. my question is is a bit more towards: Do you think in the heritable genes that you see in your study, do you think many of them will have haploinsufficiency? Will will display haploinsufficiency, or do you think? So, so I, th I, th I wouldn't be surprised to see um, phenotypes for true haploinsufficiency that would mirror the redu what you see with the reduced predicted expression for, for many of the genes. Yes. Okay. And that's the last one. This will be the last one. Okay. I'm going to go up to a high level. Thank you, Nancy, for your talk um, and your great work. Uh, I've noticed, and probably a lot of us notice, it's not going to be news, that a lot of the phenotypes that you show are going to be highly dependent on how those phenotypes are defined. And working with clinical data, we know there's lots of issues and, um, and challenges that we face. And so I really just want you to opine a little bit, someone coming from statistical genetics, to talk about the phenotyping problem and what you're thinking, and just, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so, so, so you always, we wish we had research level diagnoses, but the, the main thing I cling to is the following. If we, I care about translation. We're doing this discovery research for a reason. And if our effect sizes are not big enough to be seen in electronic medical records, we're done. Because that's where we have to do the translation. We are not going to have research level diagnoses to do translation with. We are going to have worse than what we've got in the kinds of EMR data available at Vanderbilt. Um, because for the most part, I mean, Josh has worked on these sorts of algorithms for quite a while now. And so being able to use the FIWAS codes is much better than just you know, using the, the ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes. And so on the one hand, I, I don't know if it'll work the way we all hope. But I think over the next year or two, the amount of data that's going to be available with electronic health records will be so substantial that we will know for sure whether we're going to be able to do translation this way. And I, I, am, I remain cautiously optimistic. I think that um, the signal is there, and it's up to us to find ways, the right ways, to find it and make use of it. I mean, that's what we do, right? That's why we're all here. So, and I think we can, but it, it's clearly going to be messier than research quality diagnoses. But, but it has to be done because this is where translation is. That's, that's, so we have to do it. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank Nancy for a fantastic talk. Thank you for the